Okay, Alex, I have started the recording. So I'm gonna turn it over to you for the introduction. Perfect, thanks so much, John. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, hello all. Uh, I'm so pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Lauren Bennett and Ankita Bakshi for our last forum of the fall semester. Uh, Lauren leads the spatial analysis and data science software development team at Esri. In this role, she oversees the R&D of the ArcGIS analytical framework which includes spatial and spatiotemporal statistics, raster and multidimensional analysis, machine learning, and big data analytics. She directs releases of new spatial data science capabilities across a wide range of products and applications, including desktop, enterprise, and SaaS. Lauren received a BA in geography uh, from McGill University, an MS in geographic and cartographic science. Uh, from George Mason University and her PhD in Information Systems and Technology from Claremont Graduate University. Ankita is a senior product engineer for the spatial statistics team at Esri. With a background in environmental engineering and computer science, Ankita loves to do uh, doing the investigative work of finding patterns in the data. She's passionate about providing solutions for social, economic, racial, and environmental challenges using spatial analysis and data science. In her role, Ankita enjoys researching, finding software solutions, and creating video and written content to make the data analysis tools more approachable and applicable to real-world challenges. Outside of work, Ankita enjoys going on hikes, painting landscapes, dancing, and listening to Bollywood music. Lauren and Ankita, I just want to extend a big thank you and welcome from everyone here at the Center for Geospatial Analytics. Uh, we're so excited that you could join us for our GIS Week Forum and we look forward to hearing from you. So uh, I think with that, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And thank you, Alex, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I know, when when John said he was gonna start admitting people and suddenly there was 50 people, it's quite the showing. Um, it's awesome. I also learned I need to completely re my, re rewrite my bio because Ankitas was so awesome and now I need to uh, do it differently, clearly. Um, okay, so uh, no need to introduce ourselves. That was way, that's awesome that you got a kind of sense of who we are um, and we are thrilled to be here. So I am going to share my screen because we have a lot of content to cover. We always, this is always our challenge is we always want to talk about everything and everything is a lot of things. So um, we're going to go through it as quickly as we can. Um, so we're gonna talk about machine, you can see my screen, right? Ankita, can you thumbs up that yeah. it's good? Okay, yeah. good. Um, so we're talking about machine learning tools for finding spatial clusters. Um, and it's one tiny piece of this really big area that Ankita and I work in, in spatial statistics and spatial machine learning. Though we have found in recent years, if you put machine learning in the title, you get a lot more people to attend, which I think is kind of a shame because it's no better than any, it's all about solving problems, which I guess we're gonna talk about. Um, so when we think about clustering, we kind of think about it in two different ways, particularly in the context of ArcGIS and the way that we've built tools in for doing clustering. Um, we really think about it in the context of kind of statistical clustering and then machine learning based clustering. The tools that we've got for doing statistical clustering are really around kind of answering this question about the patterns that we're seeing. So we're, we're trying to figure out how likely is it that the pattern that we're seeing is different from random? So how likely is it that this pattern that we're seeing could have happened randomly? Because we do randomly see clusters in the landscape. Um, and if we picked up a bunch of points and threw them on the ground, we might randomly see clusters. And if we put a bunch of resources into a random cluster, we're probably wasting our resources. So we ask this question, how likely is it that this pattern's random? Um, and we use statistics to answer that question. So we find these clusters of high and low values. Um, and that's really what uh, statistical clustering is all about. 
spatial statistical clustering. Now, machine learning based clustering is often a lot more about finding just kind of these natural clusters in the data. Um, that would be based on purely location, kind of like those points that we see. Um, sometimes it's based on location on, on just values. So I just want to find natural clusters kind of like in data space as if you plotted your data on a chart and looked for essentially the same clusters that we see with those points. But if those weren't locations, but they were just, you know, two, two values that we were looking at. Um, or we look at location and values or or we look at location values and time and kind of bring it all together. Um, I like to think about this, um, the clustering with machine learning oftentimes as kind of this is something in, in many cases that I could do, maybe, especially for like the location. It's something that I could do visually. I could do given enough time and enough evaluation of the data, you know, I'm going to find the, these natural clusters, but based on, you know, how much data I want to, to cluster um, or how often I want to do it, it's just not possible to do it manually. And so it's kind of this way of saying, let's let the algorithms find these clusters that I would be able to find, but I can automate it in this way. Um, it's kind of like um, I, when I think about like, uh, deep learning and a lot of the big applications we see for something like deep learning where you know we're looking for we're we're using these incredibly sophisticated algorithms to find all the airplanes in an image and it's like it's this incredibly sophisticated algorithm but the question you're answering is actually very simple like i could ask my 6 year old to find all the airplanes in an image i just couldn't ask my 6 year old to find all the airplanes in a million images because there's only so many hours in the day and I don't have an army of six-year-olds. So we need these sophisticated algorithms to help us kind of automate these processes. And, and that's one of the things that th these machine learning techniques are really good at. So what I would say is, and the reason I kind of joke that, you know, it's it kind of bums me out that more folks will come to a machine learning uh, session than a stat session um, is because one's not better than the other. and no one's problem is that they need machine learning, right? Like we have a question that we want to answer and we should really use the best tool to answer that question. And so making sure that we're focused on the, the problem that we're trying to solve and the questions that we're trying to answer as opposed to the method that we're using, I think is really important. And I think it's becoming easier than ever to get real caught up in the methods. Um, and I get it. I mean, we all like, I mean, we're, we're humans. We are drawn by shiny objects. I just think that we have to be really critical of why we're choosing a method. Is it really the best method or is it the one that we think is going to sound the best? Um, and just making sure we're holding ourselves to, to that as we're going through and picking these methods. OK. All that said, we are going to talk about these machine learning based approaches, because in addition to um, focusing on the problem, the and, and assuming that you're, the problem you're trying to solve is one that's well solved by these machine learning based approaches, um, the best way to use these methods, they can be really kind of push button easy to use. Um, but the key to using them well is to really understand how they work so that we can, you know, set the parameters appropriately and so that we can evaluate the results appropriately. Okay, so I'm going to start with density based clustering. This is where we're finding natural clusters based purely on location. So you can see we have a bunch of points on our map and our goal here is to find these natural clusters and I might have been able to, you know, draw circles around each of these kind of naturally. We're trying to use these methods to, to automate that. So within ArcGIS, we have three different ways that we can do that, um, three different algorithms that we've implemented. One, which is kind of um, probably the most broadly used just because it's been around the longest called DB scan. Then we've got HDB scan and we've got optics. And we're gonna talk a little bit about each of them. And hopefully at the end, you'll kind of have a sense of how each of them work generally. And I, I will say kind of with all of these, we're talking about like, kind of like it works kind of like this. And the goal is for you to conceptually understand how it works, not to be able to go back and kind of write the algorithm. That's not really what's important. What's important is understanding conceptually how it works. OK, so the way that dbscan works is we start by 
um, kind of defining how many features you need to be part of a cluster. And like a cluster would have to have, let's say, five features in it. So what the tool does is, and that includes yourself, what the tool does is it goes out and defines for every feature something that's called a core distance, right? So the core distance is the distance at which you have those, you get to those five neighbors. Then there's this concept of a search distance within dbscan, because you're kind of saying, I know that I want to find five neighbors, five, I, I need five features in a cluster. And if they're beyond 100 meters, then it's too far to look not a cluster. And so that search distance is that 100 meters. And so when that core distance, the distance to get to five, is less than the search distance, then you're part of a cluster. If that um, search distance, um, if to get to the core distance, you have to exceed the search distance, then you won't be marked as part of a cluster. So we're really doing this comparison between the core distance and the search distance. Um, so that's roughly how it works. It's actually very simple. It's it's kind of an iterative thing. It goes feature to feature and does that um, analysis. Now, HDB scan is a little more complex, and we're not going to get too much into the kind of al how the algorithm works. Um, but it is a hierarchical clustering method. Um, one of the strengths of HDB scan is that you you, it will essentially allow for more variation in the definition of what it means to be a cluster. So one of the things you'll notice here is that um, the search distance doesn't change for dbscan. There's one search distance. So if you have one area that's very dense and one area that's more sparse, it will not change its search distance based on, oh, I'm in a dense area. So to define a cluster here, it's a little different than what a cluster would look like in a sparse area. It is always going to be the same. HDB scan through its use of this kind of hierarchical approach actually allows for some places to um, have to be considered a cluster that in another place would not be considered a cluster based on the local, the more local density in that area. Now that's actually a property that is shared with optics. Now I'm kind of biased, but I think optics is my favorite and it's mainly just because I get so much information and I, I learn so much about my data through optics. So the way that optics works is it starts at a feature and it goes through and it finds its closest neighbor. And then from that feature, it goes to its next closest neighbor. It cannot go backwards to a feature that's already been touched. And it goes through and it finds all these closest neighbors. And it takes those distances and it creates what we call, what's called a reachability plot. So this reachability chart essentially charts out all of those distances. Now, what we're looking for are peaks and valleys. So the valleys in our reachability chart become clusters. So if you think about it, the valleys are the places where the distance are small. Every, every next point you go to is a small distance. The peaks are places where you have to jump. Either you jump to another cluster or you jump to maybe a noise point, which has another jump to the next point, which has another jump and eventually you get back into a cluster. So you've got these peaks and you've got these valleys. And one of the things that I really like about optics is that it allows you by looking at this reachability chart to also start to refine your clusters. So for instance, I might say, you know, based on if we if we went here and we had a, a threshold that said a peak has to be so high to, to differentiate between clusters, then everything in here might be considered one cluster. But if I make that um, more sensitive, then it will actually distinguish between these two and call these unique clusters. So that's a really powerful aspect of optics that, that we can really kind of fine tune our clustering so that we can get the algorithm to really match what we're envisioning clusters are. Um, so kind of that was a whirlwind and it's, it's not going to get any less whirlwindy. So I hope you're kind of like bracing and I like promise we'll point you to resources at the end where we can, where you can kind of dig in deeper, lots of resources, but um, gives you a sense of kind of the value, like the pros and cons of each DB scan super fast, HDB scan um, optics can be quite computationally intensive, but there's a lot more optics has the most um, 
kind of user input, which is great, but both HDB scan and optics allow for um, to find clusters of varying density, which is very, very important for most real world data, I would say. Okay, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Ankita, who's going to show us density-based clustering in action. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Let me share my screen. Okay. You see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So we are going to look at some of the examples, or we'll take one example and do a couple of um, iterative tool running on it to understand uh, whatever Lauren has talked about and specifically, and um, I like optics too, Lauren, if that's a surprise, <laughs> you should know that I love optics too. So I'm gonna uh, run a density-based clustering tool. So I'm basically using ArcGIS Pro if, um, if someone hasn't used it before. It is a software, it's a des desktop application that Esri um, creates. So I'm using ArcGIS Pro and we have as a team, we do a lot of um, work in developing these tools in, in the software. So basically to start off this example, I have these basketball um, shot points by a very famous American basketball player, um, Steph Curry. And this data has been collected over a couple of years, I think 2011 to uh, 2016, over all the matches that he has played. So what we really are interested in looking are some, some clusters in this data that can help us understand some patterns, the way that, that uh, Curry takes shots when he, he's playing a match. So to start with uh, density-based clustering, I'm going to input these points as input point features to this tool. And then I'll use optics because the fact is optics is a great way to find clusters as Lauren mentioned that are it's not necessarily of the same densities. And it also gives you more flexibility to fine tune your clusters. And we'll see that in a, in a minute, how that would really impact the results that we are seeing. Um, so for features per cluster, I'm going to give like 20. That's the core, core distance that Lauren mentioned that in, in, within this search distance, if there are 20 features, then it would be considered as a cluster. And for cluster sensitivity, let's start with 10. And since analysis, I'm probably I'm confident that you know is, is an iterative process. You run the analysis, you look at the results, and then you rerun the analysis to make sure the results that you're getting uh, answers the question that you're asking. So I'm running this tool. And at the end, you see these clusters that the tool creates, so you see these big cluster around the three pointer, some clustering here. These are some distinct clusters that, that you can see um, on the map. And if I open the reachability plot, similar to what Lauren showed in, in the presentation, you can see these are uh, peaks and there are valleys in here. So the valley really represents these dense clusters. So deeper the valley is denser, um, those clusters are. So let me just select this dense cluster, you see this, this dense cluster over here. But I can also see that there are some valleys that could be considered as separate clusters. So if I increase the sensitivity parameter in the tool, I'll see that I can break these clusters down into even finer clusters. So that would help us understand this big cluster even better. But when I'm looking at this data, as I told you, this data has been collected over um, many years. One thing that I miss from this information is the time component. How does um, Curry make shots maybe during uh, a match? How, how does that change? How does this clustering change over time during a match? So if, if I add time in my analysis, so let's say within 10 meters, I want to look at clusters that are not just um, clusters in space, but let's say also in time. So here with by providing a time interval, what I'm see, what I'm telling essentially telling the tool to do is find the clusters that are close in space, but also the clusters that are close in time. So all the points that are within a minute uh, are um, considered as the neighbors of that point to be considered as a cluster. 
So when I run this analysis, let me just quickly show the difference in here. It's too much to digest at this point. I, I feel like now we get more information that how things have changed over time. But now these clusters are just stacked on each other because they're not just clusters in space, but they're also clusters in time. So to better understand these clusters, what I can do is um, I can enable time in, in this layer. So if I say each feature has a time, then I, I can look at this analysis result, both spatially and temporally. So when I run this, let me just turn off the input points and you can see that this is a cluster and then, oh, maybe I should just do this. Not include this. Yes, and now you can see how clusters are changing over time. So this is really important, and and there's another way to look at it. But then you you see that as as we progress through our time slider, how these clusters are changing both in space and in time. But one interesting way to also look at it is in three D. So if you open a 3D layer, you can see that this cluster in blue are probably the points that you see at the beginning. These clusters in green are the points that you see at like later in the game. And then there are other clusters up there. What's interesting is that we also um, in the tool output have this chart that helps you again, understand some spatial and temporal patterns in your data. So here I can see that Let's just select this red cluster, the pink cluster. So it's over here. If you see the selected sign color, it's like over here. And it also marks as the um, end of the first quarter. So you can see that at that time, Curry likes to make shots from three pointer locations. And if you look at the second and the third quarter and, and this say, consistent cluster, you'll see that near near this area, near the, the hoop. And then at the end, if I look at this cluster, again, you can see at the end of the game, Curry likes to make shots, uh, again, three pointers in stressful situation, trying to get those points in. So these are several ways to look at um, the spatial temporal clusters in your data. And then uh, I was talking about reachability charts. So here again, if I look at the reachability plot, I can see that there are some valleys that could be considered as a separate cluster. And if I actually, I actually ran the tool again with a sensitivity of 50. And if I open that reachability plot, I'm gonna give us some more space. You can see now this big cluster that was very dense here, but also part of this bigger cluster is now split into multiple smaller clusters for us to to analyze and visualize our results. So optics really gives you that flexibility to define what a cluster is, find clusters in um, the locations with very varying densities and also have the ability to tweak your clusters. So yeah, that's an example of um, density-based clustering. I'm gonna hand it back to Lauren. All right. I was trying to answer some questions in the chat while we were going. Um, thank you, Ankita. The the one of the big so this particular basketball data we aren't we cannot share. Um, but the the question that John posted about the um, optics being uh, impacted by where you start is it 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 can be, but we did a lot of testing during development and. Um, found that it's not dramatic and we also make some smart decisions about where to start to limit the impact that that start will have um, i can give a little bit more detail later about that too um, if we've got time or later via um, uh, direct messages afterwards too because we will not disappear after this okay so moving on to density-based clustering, sorry, to multivariate clustering. Okay, so we've talked about just location. 
Next, we're talking about um, very data where we've got both space and also attributes. Though we're actually gonna start with data where really all we care about are the attributes, although we never stop caring about space. And we'll talk about a, a little bit about that later. Um, so you can imagine this data where we've got these variables associated with them, a bunch of different variables and they have different characteristics. Um, our goal when we're doing multivariate clustering is to create groups where within the group, the features are as similar as possible. And between the groups, the features are as different as possible. So we want, we want groups that are each incredibly distinct from each other. And so a really common method for doing this is k-means. And so ArcGIS has k-means in it. It's called multivariate clustering. Um, and essentially what we do is this is you can think about that data space, right? So you have a bunch of attributes, maybe population density, income, age, and we ch we plot them um, in this case in 3D. Now you can have way more than three variables, but good luck making a visualization that helps you explain what that looks like. It's a little more than my brain's capable of handling, um, but you can imagine that with however many variables you've got, it's much like this, where we're looking in this data space and we're looking for these natural clusters of these variables where, you know, all of them are kind of, you might find a cluster where it's high, high population density and um, low income and low median age. And they're all kind of clustered in that general area. And so those become a cluster. And so what k-means does is it goes through and it creates groups or clusters based on that that are as distinct as possible. And so um, you there is some decision making here, which is how many clusters do you want to create? And there's a an F statistic built into the tool that helps you try to figure out what the best number of clusters is going to be. Um, but I will say it's quite an iterative process. The other thing is um, it, it really depends on the data, but it will become like the per the the most distinct groups you'll create is where every cluster, every feature is in its own group, right? Because they are completely distinct. Um, and so there's always this trade-off between kind of the parsimony of how many groups you're going to have and um, how distinct that they'll get. Um, but it finds the, the distinct groups and, um, and that's kind of the output. And, and one of the things that I think is really important to think about is how we, how we visualize this result. So one is our outputs a map. That's quite different than any other place you're going to run k-means, right? And one of the things I love about that is it's not a spatial method, but it is pretty unusual not to see some sort of spatial pattern in your data. And that's because geography matters. And, and more specifically, things that are closer together are more related than things that are farther apart. We get into the first law of geography, right? And so um, what we often see is that the clusters that get created, like that blue cluster might be, you know, some part of California and it's a cluster within California. Maybe it's also a cluster within New York. So you're not limited to saying that they have to be contiguous in any way, but you do still see some spatial clustering on your map. And the other thing I'd say is that on that map, you might have a blue group, a red group, a green group, and that's really never enough to understand what you're looking at because so if I did this clustering, I said, well, I've got a red group, a green group, and a blue group. Isn't that interesting? It's like, no, that's not interesting. What is the green group? What does it mean? And so we use um, we use uh, box plots to help us understand that. And so these box plots will show us what the overall distribution of the whole data set is. That's what's in gray on the box plots. And then where each group falls within that overall distribution. So in this case, we would see that like the the blue group, the light blue group is high population density, low average income, low median age. And so we can use this combination of the map and these box plots to help us interpret the results of our analysis. Now, we also have a tool built into um, ArcGIS that we call spatially constrained multivariate clustering. This is an implementation of an algorithm called SCATER. 
um, which it was actually originally um, published by a, a professor of statistics, uh, uh, Renato Asensao, who has recently in the last six months joined our team. Um, he retired from his position in Brazil and um, is working remotely for our team full time, which is amazing. And we're super excited to have him and doing a lot of exciting work with him. Um, but the first, our first introduction to Hanada was our work on Skater. And so spatially constrained multivariate clustering, very similar in concept and goal to k-means in that we're trying to create groups that are as alike within the group and different between groups as possible. But here we have an extra constraint, which is a spatial constraint, which says that we, we need, every cluster has to be contiguous. So the way that this approach works is using something called a minimum spanning tree, which very kind of overly simplified works this way. So you have um, each feature is linked to other features based on these constraints. The, the length of that link has to do with how close they are in data space. So things that are very similar in their attribute values have shorter links and things that are very different in attribute values will have longer links. Um, but you can only be linked if you meet that spatial constraint that, that your neighbors. And so what, what happens is we go through and we start cutting the longest links until we create the number of groups that was asked for. And so what we end up with is these distinct groups um, that are as similar as possible given that spatial constraint. Now, what I will say is that when you spatially constrain clustering, your clusters will inherently not be as distinct, right? Because you have introduced this very strict constraint on those groups that will, in, in many cases, overpower your ability to keep them as distinct as possible. So it, it's it's about creating these contiguous areas and then these attributes help us decide um, what, what, we'll, what you'll see if you try k-means and spatial, spatially constrained multivariate clustering and multivariate clustering, which I always do because it's such a kind of um, interesting way to get to know your data when you're just starting to explore data, even beyond um, then having a, a, a set of questions that are answered by these clustering tools, just getting to know your data can be one really uh, powerful way to use these tools, um, is that you'll find that the distinctness of the clusters is significantly less when you do multivariate or spatially constrained. That said, sometimes what you need, the output that you need is contiguous groups. And when that's the case, um, it's a really uh, nice tool to be able to use that will take into account some meaningful attributes that you want to, to kind of account for. And again, the output there is a mixture of maps and these box plots, which are critical. Okay, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Ankita, who is going to show us these tools. Thanks, Lauren. I was actually going to press leave instead of screen share. <laughs> <laughs> it's in red. Like, huh? Press me. <laughs> okay. Hope you can see my screen now. Is it coming? Can you see it? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so basically, I'm going to show you an example of um, how we can use multivariate clustering, especially spatially constrained multivariate clustering, because I'm looking at uh, a problem that I think would require spatially contiguous um, clusters. So what I'm, what we are all looking at here, these are house pricing data for this King County in Washington. So each point has um, information about the house, the price, and how many bedrooms are there, square footage, and every information that I need for um, determining the house prices. So let's say if I want to model these house prices using, let's say, a regression analysis where uh, my house price is my dependent variable and I have other factors um, like square footage, bedrooms, proximity to um, water or, or other factors that could affect my uh, house pricing rates. But as we all know, house pricing is a very spatial problem. 
by just um, symbolizing my data based on price, I can quickly get a sense that there are locations where they are near water body, the prices are super high. This is this island where they're comparatively higher. And then there are houses here um, where they're more inland and have lower house prices. So it's a very spatial problem. So if I had to uh, run a regression model on the entire data set, it's not, it's not going to, um, if it's just one model trying to fit on the entire data set, it's not going to um, tell you or kind of, it will downplay the, the spatial components, the spatial activities that are um, going on in my data set. So what I really want to do is, is split this data set into multiple regions or zones so that each region itself has very similar attributes so that if I'm trying to model the house pricing in that region, all the, all the area, all the houses in that region are very similar and they're as distinct as possible from the other regions. So this is why I'm going to use spatially constrained multivariate clustering to find those regions. Um, and let me open the tool and talk you through the parameters that I'll use in the tool. So for my input features, I'm going to use my um, housing data and very intuitive example of price and um, square footage. I really want to find the areas uh, where the prices are similar for similar square footage. And if I, and I also will create an output table and, and show you in a minute why, it's, why I did that. And if I run the tool, there is a way to provide number of clusters in the tool. So sometimes you already know how many spatial clusters you want. So if you are um, clustering an area with, you, you know how many supervisors are there for each area, then you can provide the number of clusters you want in the tool. But in, in this scenario, I just ran it without any number of clusters and the tool will determine the number of clusters for me for which the, the cluster itself is very homogeneous, but then the clusters among themselves are um, very distinct. So when I run this analysis, I see us get two clusters and this output table that I created actually has um, a pseudo F statistics chart. So what this chart is basically trying to tell me is at number of clusters two, this value is high. And this high value, the higher the value is, it means the clusters at value two were able to have most distinct qualities among the clusters, but the, the heterogeneity between the clusters are intact. But when I'm looking at what I'm really essentially looking for in this um, chart is this elbow right here. And the elbow really tells me that um, at number of clusters eight, so if I had eight number of clusters instead of two number of clusters, it wouldn't impact the homogeneity of the cluster itself. So if I'm trying to um, create more refined results, more smaller clusters in order to fit uh, linear regression models in, in these regions, I can in fact rerun this model with number of clusters eight. So if I give eight, but it wouldn't compromise um, the homogeneity within the cluster too much. So th that's what the elbow in the chart represents. So I'm just gonna rerun the tool with um, eight number of clusters this time to understand and more refine my, um, my cluster analysis. So while it's uh, running, let's wait for a few seconds. Okay. So now we have eight clusters and I can start seeing those, those initial clusters that I was actually seeing visually. And as Lauren mentioned earlier, that some of these methods, like if you have a lot of resources and time, you could do it maybe um, by looking at your data and understanding a deep understanding of your data would help you. But then this, these analysis tools are really important and helpful to just give that result that distinguishes and it's intuitive like we were seeing this this cluster and this cluster when we uh, visualize this data through um, price data 
another way to understand this cluster are these very useful um, box plots. So let me dock this and zoom in a little bit to understand what these each cluster really mean in my data set. So here um, I can see that the blue, green, yellow, and brown clusters and this purple cluster are above the third quantile for the price and the square footage living. So the blue cluster here, if I click on it, um, this corresponds to a cluster where living space is smaller than the other two clusters, the brown and the green cluster, but the prices are higher. And this may indicate the desirable part of the town. And as we see, this is um, this area, which is on the east of Lake Washington, if I'm not wrong, and it's a very desirable part of the town. And in this cluster, living space may not be the main driving factor for sale price. And I think that's what the beauty of this tool is, that it will break it down into different clusters. And really, if, if I were to, um, run a regression analysis on the entire data set, maybe living space would have come as an important factor, but not for this area. So that's why it's very important to find those finer clusters um, in your data that have that homogeneity within, within the cluster. And similarly, the green region here is an island. Um, so it has prices lower than the blue cluster, but um, the 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 square footage living could be a little higher. So just getting an understanding of this data. And if I look at these um, pink and gray and red cluster, we can see that even though the pink cluster, it's cheaper than the red cluster, but it's you're actually get, getting the similar square footage living. So this may indicate that you can get cheaper house uh, for the same space, living space, for the cluster in pink. And this may also indicate why the, the linear model wouldn't work. So just really help you understand these integrities in your, in your data can help you um, further explore your data. And this is, this is an example. It's a part of a learn lesson. It's a four hour learn lesson that kind of talks you through um, the linear regression model and why it doesn't work for this data. And then it talks about this um, spatially constrained multivariate clustering, then fitting linear model on each of these regions. So I'm going to drop a link to that um, learn lesson in, in the chat, just because if you're interested that, that this data exists and then you can play around with it. And there's a lot to it. You can, you can run so many analysis once you understand um, and can make clusters of your data. Thank you, Ankita. Okay, so we have... 17 minutes and we have one more thing that we definitely want to show. So I'm going to go really quickly through the slides. I um, this always happens. We just want to show you all the things. Um, okay, so I want to talk one, really quickly about a, a method called build balanced zones. What's really cool about build balanced zones. So essentially we're trying to solve the way I think about it like the opposite problem, basically. So with multivariate clustering, we're trying to create groups that are similar in within, different between. Build balance zones, we're trying to build groups that are the same. Each one of them is similar to the other group. Um, so very, very different than our goal with multivariate clustering. So we're trying to create groups that are uniform to each other. And the way that it works is using an algorithm that is called a genetic algorithm. And so essentially what we do is we, we can give it, we have to dis describe how we want it to, um, what the criteria are for building these zones. So either we can have an attribute target. We might say, I want each group to have about 100,000 people in it. Um, I might say, um, that I want, that I have a number of zones that I want to create and I want it to kind of equalize a particular attribute, or I might just say I want it to create a particular number of zones. So I have a couple of different ways to do it. What's really cool about this though is how the genetic algorithm works, in my mind at least. So we also, you also have a couple of criteria you can set, like you might prioritize area, uh, equal area or compactness, um, or you might prioritize having the same number of features in a group. Um, you can also provide a couple of other attributes that are of interest to you when creating those zones. Um, but what's particularly interesting to me is the 
the genetic algorithm just because it's really uh, interesting. Um, the way that it works is you have seeds. Uh, you, per, you pick a feature and you build a zone out of that feature and then you go through and there's a, a very much a random component to this where each of these seeds is picked randomly and it goes through um, and creates these zones. And each of those zones gets a score. And that score kind of says, how good of a job is this particular out layout of zones doing for meeting the criteria that are required? And it does that over and over again using a bunch of different um, uh, seeds, those random seeds. And those become what are essentially called a generation. And it then will pick the top 50% to move on to the next generation. So the way that you can think about this, the reason it's called a genetic algorithm is it's very much follows this kind of survival of the fittest um, approach. So the fittest survive and they move on, the other ones die, um, that they, they move on and the, they are also then um, permutated to create different zones based on those, that set of the fittest zones and those get crossover, there's new offspring and those become part of this next generation. Um, and again, fitness scores are calculated, the top 50% move on to the next generation. And this goes on and on and on and on and on and on um, for quite some time until things converge and the mutations are no longer, those generations are no longer getting you better fitness scores until you get to the point where heuristically you can say this is a pretty good um, optimal kind of set of zones that we feel good about. So um, uh, a pretty, I think, interesting approach to doing it. It's the kind of problem that this kind of optimization is is traditionally just really hard, very computationally intensive. There is no possible way to test every single possible combination. That's just not computationally realistic. And so having a heuristic like this that uh, makes smart, smart decisions is really important. And that's why the genetic algorithm is so powerful here. And so to finish it off, Ankit is going to show us build balance zones really quickly. His famous last words. Quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me try this again. Can you see my screen? Perfect. Yes. Thank you. So here, quickly, as Lauren said, I'm just going to quickly go through this example where um, I have these affordable housing projects in the city of San Francisco. So each point represents um, a project. And then within each project, there are multiple housing units. Some of them are affordable. Some of them are at market rate. So even before um, I run the analysis, the bill balance zone, there is something interesting that I wanted to show you because when we show demonstrations or we, when we show analysis, we generally skip that time consuming part of where you make your data analysis ready, where you look at your data, understand your data, visualize it, and which is like the first step of any analysis because your analysis is, is as good as the data you provide. So making sure your data is good is so important. And there's a dedicated view in ArcGIS Pro called data engineering. So when you open this data engineering view for um, a, a data set that you have, you can see there are many fields that this data contains and then in additional information. But what I'm really interested in looking at is the timeline of these projects that are going on. So if I just filter my data based on date, select them and click calculate, I can see the statistics for uh, my data field. So here I can see when my, um, my project started in general in, in 2013 and then so on. So just a good sense for me to have when I'm looking at my data. Similarly, I can look at numeric values in my data set. So I have all these numeric values. I can calculate them, turn off the date values. And what I'm seeing right now is um, this field called supervisor district. So there are so many statistics available for all my uh, numeric fields to help me understand my data. But I think what 
really interesting are these chart previews kind of help you understand the distribution of your data. So here I'm looking at supervisor districts. So if I create a bar chart for each of my supervisors in um, that are um, responsible for these projects, I can see that the supervisor district six has a lot of projects. And if I try to break it down um, and try to summarize how many um, of these supervisors are in fact in charge of project units, because as I said, each unit, or each project has multiple housing units, I can see that one person or maybe it's a couple person, the, the district six has so many housing um, projects that the, the, the distribution is not balanced. Like some of the people maybe are working overtime than some of the people like who are responsible for district 11. So basically what here I want to do is balance this workload of um, supervisors using build balance zones as the name suggests. And one of the important things about this is this spatial component that is inherent in this tool because if I distribute these projects randomly to um, supervisor districts, then one supervisor would have to go all the way across the, the city to, to supervise some other projects. So what I really want is to create 11 zones because that's how, how many number of uh, supervisors I have, and then try to um, balance the project units among these supervisors. And if I run it, and I said spatial constraint is inherent in this tool, so um, the the zones or the regions that will be created will be contiguous. And once the tool completes, it created these eleven zones in this area, and you can see that each color represents one zone, and you can see these are contiguous in nature. And if I look at the chart and then try to compare it with what I had earlier. The distribution seems more normally distributed, like more balanced than before. But this is an important thing to understand that this is a spatial optimization problem. It's not always gonna give a perfect solution from a single tool run. So there are options in the tool in advanced parameters to increase the population size and number of generations. So as Lauren mentioned before, um, the tool really finds these optimal solutions from a set of all the available solutions. So if you increase the population size, the, the availability of um, options increase for um, the, the options increases for this tool and the number of generation, you get more refined results as you increase the number of generations. But it's basically a trade-off between um, accuracy and performance. So if you increase this number to a really high number, it'll take time, but maybe it's not worth the accuracy that you'll receive. So it's basically an art and science of, um, of, of doing analysis. Just, just keep on um, either if you're happy with it or you want to really define more results, then you can use the advanced parameter. One thing that I wanted to talk about, which I didn't talk about here, is since this is affordable housing um, project, I didn't talk about the affordability. So let me show you how many affordable units are there? So if I click on this chart, I can see that most, some, some of the, um, so this is the aggregation of how many affordable houses are there and how many market rate um, houses are there. So in general, I see the uh, market rate houses are about 1.5 times the affordable houses rates. So if I want to, balance the workload of my supervisors, but also maintain this proportion that each supervisor should get some affordable houses and 1.5 times uh, market value, just kind of maintaining this overall uh, proportion that I have in my data. There's an option in the tool that if I just use this field, oops, should dock this one. So if I add this and then maintain proportion, let me just run it with more population so that we see um, what, what I'm saying and then also give you an output table. 
to talk about how you can actually look at how accurate the results are, or do you want to really rerun your analysis to understand your data? So it's going to take a few seconds more. And as, as I said earlier, it's the um, it's this trade-off between speed and accuracy. So here it's taking longer than it took before, but it's what it's doing, it's finding now solution instead of from 100 options from 1000 options and instead of doing this iteratively for 50 times but it's doing it a thousand times um, and the output table really will help you understand that should i do it more than thousand times or should i do it more than um, for for more number of population size so as the tool writes the output and here one thing to really notice is that now the tool is trying to balance four constraints. It's trying to balance the zones, it's trying to balance the project units, affordable houses, um, and also trying to make it contiguous. So it's as you add more and more parameters or more and more constraints, it will get difficult to find that perfect solution. And with that output, you can see that this is the total fitness Fitness really means how good the solution is. And you're seeing that as the number of generations kept on increasing, kind of got little better results. But then at some point, it just stopped being better. So you might not need to run it for a long time because um, the accuracy didn't increase as much. So just to finish it off, I wanted to quickly show you how the um, affordable and mostly market rates are distributed among each zones. So you can see like in most of the cases, um, each supervisor gets more market rates than the affordable houses, which is the overall proportion of, of my data. So really helping you balance. So the only big difference between the example that I showed before versus this one is in the previous example, each feature within the zone was homogeneous, but here what we are trying to make is like the zones itself are homogeneous. So that's the big difference between the two. And yeah, that's the fastest I could go. <laughs> I think so you covered a lot. I, I'm hoping that the um, I'm hoping that the data engineering kind of little 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 show of data engineering um, was something new for most people. Uh, Ankita has been on uh, the team of folks that have been working really hard on data engineering over the last three years now, honestly, and it um, is really exciting. And I hope that if you didn't know about it, now you do and you can give it a try because it's pretty awesome. Um, I just wanted to finish with this slide. Uh, if you go to esriurl.com slash spatial stats, you'll find um, a ton of workshops that you can check out. Um, there's also a data science MOOC, which is happening right now, and it is the registration is closed, although I know I, I think a couple of you are, are taking it. Um, but the I did just look today in the next it will be offered again in a year, but um, it's better than not knowing so we know it'll be next year and that's it's it's awesome, but there's also a ton of resources in the meantime all these workshops are there there's a lot of hands on. Um, learn lessons and tutorials and actually I can't believe i'm doing this, this is like an old image of our. Um, resources page, but if I go to esriurl.com slash spatial stats, um, a couple of our colleagues have been working really hard um, to update our uh, resources page. It's now an awesome hub site, um, which has still the same workshops available, but also um, has kind of created some hands-on paths for learning a bunch of different things um, around spatial stats and spatial machine learning and some other resources. So um, definitely check out the resources page. Also gives you a little view into our team, um, awesome team of folks. So yeah, that's it. I know we didn't technically leave a lot of time for questions, but I know I don't have anything right now. I don't know about Ankita, but we are definitely happy to stay and um, answer whatever questions you might have for us. I'll put these links in the chat so that they are, I'll put this one in the chat because a, a MOOC that's about, that will be offered in a year doesn't seem like a super useful link right now. 
Yeah, and I also put the link to a blog post we had for data engineering, which uses the same data set that I showed you to kind of uh, with some step-by-step um, -step things that you can do to understand that data. So I think if you're interested, I think that's a very good resource too. Hi, uh, so it looks like uh, Skylar is asking, can we revisit the ArcGIS page before uh, the end of the meeting? Uh, we covered it pretty quickly. So that meaning this page? Is this, oh, I'm not sharing yet, am I? Is this what you mean? No, uh, uh, Ankita's page, I believe. Or no, um, I forget, Never mind. The uh, GIS, ArcGIS software page rather. Oh, the, the, the demonstration that I was showing, did you have any questions about that? Um, if you could kind of cover it again or just what the results were maybe. For the, the balance zones? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I mean, maybe I can connect with you after this if you had any specific questions about it, if that's okay. If there are other questions. Um, All right. Can, yeah, okay. Yeah, Thank I'll, you. Yeah, I'll post my um, my email ID. So if you want to reach out. Great, thank you. Sure. Are there any other questions? Or discussion topics? It was very much our pleasure to, uh, I wish we were in person, that would be way more fun. <laughs> also weird, because I don't remember being around people, but uh, it's been fun. I'm, it's, this is an awesome turnout for a GIS day presentation. So we really appreciate you all coming and hanging out with us to talk about spatial stats for an hour. It's our favorite thing to talk about. Thank you both so much. Um, yeah, we really appreciate it. And uh, that truly, that was a fantastic presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you both again. This is wonderful. <laughs> Anytime. And thank you, Alex, for hosting. Appreciate it. And the GGSO, yes. Of course, of course. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye.